Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and welcome to tonight's decolonization and democratization session, which is the third in our series. My name is Beth and I'll be chairing the session this evening. We are really excited to welcome some fantastic speakers here tonight who will be talking us through their projects around community created permanent displays looking at issues around representation, power dynamics, and knowledge sharing. Please do, please do use the uh, YouTube chat to introduce yourselves uh, and let us know where you're watching from. Um, and do put your questions in the YouTube chat that you have for our speakers. And we'll be monitoring this closely throughout both talks, uh, which will each last for about 20 minutes. And I'll be posing your questions to our speakers when they both finish their presentations in a Q&A at the end. And please also feel free to share your thoughts and join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag culture D and D. Now, although it's our third session, uh, we're still relatively new uh, at this live streaming on YouTube thing. Um, so please bear with us. Um, and if anything does go wrong, uh, we'll try and fix it as soon as possible. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speakers of the evening. Uh, we're really pleased to have Selena Hurley and Imogen Clark here, both from the Science Museum. And they're going to be talking about their collaborations and content development for Medicine, the Welcome Galleries, which uh, this week are celebrating its first anniversary since opening. So over to you, if you're ready, Selena and Imogen. So good evening, everyone. I'm just sharing my screen. Hopefully we will be there. Okay, good evening. So the two projects we're gonna be talking about tonight, Roads to Recovery and our NHS, are um, on display in Medicine, the Welcome Galleries, which opened last year. So just to give you a slight introduction to the galleries, they are a suite of five galleries on the museum's first floor with around 3000 objects on display um, from the Science Museum's holdings, which includes um, on loan from Sir Henry Wellcome's museum collection, which for some of you will know is a very broad definition of medicine, which includes amulets, laboratory glassware, surgical instruments, and representations of deities from major world religions. The galleries will be there for the next 25 years, so if you haven't had a chance to see them yet, um, you've still got some time. Um, and the, the project was a £24 million project. Our target audience was families with children aged 11 plus um, and adults, but we're really aware that there'll be younger children coming in as well as school groups, so there are targeted learning resources. And in total, it was an eight year project from beginning to end. In the creation of the new galleries, there was a commitment to tell personal stories to reveal stories already in the collection and to tell new ones. Personal stories are present in the galleries through um, commissioned artworks, including life-size portraits, objects such as these group of prosthetic limbs owned by someone affected by thalidomide, quotations and oral histories. The Science Museum has a history of working with participatory groups. And on the screen here, you can hopefully see um, some examples from our permanent and temporary displays. So we've got what makes your gender um, developed in co-creation with gendered intelligence. Some of our participants from Cameroon um, in part of the Connecting Africa display about their experience with mobile phones. Aramix to Electronica about electronic music that looked at four expert groups all with different knowledge of Daphne or Ram's machine. And finally, not all wounds are visible, part of wounded conflict casualties and care. So since 2016, um, the Science Museum's audience research team has looked to define what participation is for our organisation. And you can see four categories on the screen here. And I think the important thing to stress here is that these are a spectrum of activity. So, you know, things like consultation, contribution, collaboration and co-creation. A project can cross many of these at any one time. And for us, um, the, the, particularly the last two, the collaboration and co-creation, where decision-making is shared, um, as well as kind of knowledge and power. So with that knowledge in mind, um, I'll share my experience of working on roads to recovery. Um, and this looks at the lifelong recovery after a brain injury. And you can see on the screen here, um, 
what our final display was after two years and 22 sessions. So there is a, an object display, including a quote, as well as a seven minute film. So this project sits in the Medicine and Treatments Gallery, which I was the lead curator of, and it looks at our experiences when we encounter medical treatments. This particular section looks at how an explosion of new therapies at the end of the 19th century, including light therapy, uh, talking therapies and physiotherapies came to be. And taken in isolation, many of the objects in the Science Museum's collection do not hint at the repetitive process or long process recovery might take for a person. And sometimes the collection focuses purely on the experiences of practitioners. Person you know, might only meet their surgeon once or twice or have you know, semi-regular encounters with their pharmacist. A multifaceted treatment, including the important role of family and friends, isn't really in the collection. So we knew that working with people with lived experience was essential. We were incredibly lucky to have an experienced freelance participation coordinator called Katie Gonzalez-Bell, who'd worked on a number of science museum participation projects before, so brought a lot of her learning with her. As this project was much more of a larger gallery and a suite itself, the design and build schedules meant we had to decide the outputs in advance, uh, a film and object display. And this approach had worked really well in the Not All Wounds Visible project that I mentioned just briefly before. And in addition, as a London-based museum, but national in its remit, it was important to ensure that stories outside of London were listened to and represented. Katie made a few approaches to different organisations, and we ended up working with the Brain Injuries Rehabilitation Trust. And eventually our group of six people were all based in Yorkshire, they'd all had a brain injury, and they were all at different points of their journey. So this is our group. Um, you can see here Gary, Earl, Byron, Ben and Michael, as well as some of the wider teams. So family and friends or support workers that accompany people, um, as well as some of the Science Museum staff. All of the photographs were taken at Daniel Yorath House, where we held our sessions, uh, which is a Brain Injuries Rehabilitation Trust Centre um, just outside of Leeds. Um, our participants travelled here, so we reimbursed travel, and we also provided snacks and drinks for each of the sessions. And instead of going in depth into the practicalities of the project, which I'm happy to answer questions about, I want to spend some time looking at the expectations of both myself and the group, explaining how the film developed, and some of the challenges and benefits of the project. So on the screen now, you can see some of the group's expectations that we asked them about at the very start. Some of them aren't that surprising, and probably responses you'd expect to hear to help to plan and organise an exhibition, to have a staged project, to talk about brain injury and parts of the brain. But some of them really were surprising to me, which really focused on the participants, um, how the project might affect them, which was to help them get themselves better or to tune into themselves a bit more. And the more I learned about brain injury recovery, this became less surprising as everything in their lives is geared towards helping them towards their goals. At our final evaluation, um, some of our participants, you know, had said these expectations have been met, but they would have liked to, to have developed film editing skills as well. So in future, I think when asking this question, I'd also focus on skills as well. And for me, I knew I had a lot of learning to do. I'd never worked in a co-creative way before. Um, Katie, our um, coordinator, provided staff with training in how sessions might run about working with people who've been classed as vulnerable and about the role of staff to listen and to advocate for their group. I also had very little experience of interacting with people who have a life-changing injury um, and I was incredibly keen to support them to deliver this project. And I, although the outcomes have been predetermined, I had no idea what shape they would take or how the group might respond. And this project was different to any others that I'd worked on as the group had full editorial control over their content, which has made clear to them at the beginning and reiterated throughout. We also really reinforced that they were the experts in this. So we would be learning from them as much as they were learning from us. So these are some of the aims of the film. And to create the film, we went through the same process that we would do for any um, film. Um, we started with these key messages and outcomes that would steer our choices and act as a checklist for us. Uh, and these are on the screen now. The one that was really strong for me and comes out really strongly in the film is about equality. That a brain injury can happen to anyone and people that have a brain injury are equal to everyone else. The group really wanted to create a film that was memorable, that inspires, moves and connects to visitors. They had definite views about things they didn't want, the talking head style, anything that was depressing, boring or made them subjects of pity. 
Anything that had time jumps backwards or forwards were outrightly rejected as too confusing. And when we were kind of talking to them about the film, we found the best way of gauging opinion was to show examples which were contrasting and get them to pick between the two, rather talking in abstract terms. The group found the idea of stepping stones as a useful way of explaining their journey. So it became a way of structuring the film, which you can see on the screen now, about what happened in the past, what was happening now, and what might happen for them in the future. The group provided key words for this, uh, each section to explain the mood. So for instance, in the middle, um, where the group is talking about activities, there are words like frustration, repetition, and progress. And filming in all took a um, mixture of on location, as you can see here with each member of the group, as well as an individual studio interview. And so on gallery, it's seven minutes uh, with seating um, on a massive 84 inch screen um, with sound and subtitles um, and BSL options. So some of the challenges, some of our group had had a negative experience with filming before um, in the BBC documentary um, with Louis Theroux called A Different Brain. And you'll notice that I said we had a group of six, but our group only had five people in it. And this is because one of our participants decided to leave before the filming uh, based on their experience, but also, you know, the other issues that were and things were happening in their lives. So it meant that building up trust was essential reiterating to the group that they had control over the content and they only actually signed their consent forms at the end of the process. Our filmmaker Nick that you can see on screen came on board about halfway through the project and the narrative arc and the structure had already been set. In hindsight this had a couple of impacts. Firstly staff had had training in participatory working um, but Nick didn't so we were trying to kind of share our learning while on the job. We had to make sure we were all working in the same way and everything came back to the group's messages. It was vital that Nick saw the group as the client rather than the museum. And we also had to ensure that equal attention was given to all members of the group. Secondly, when it came to the first rough cut of the film, it was entirely talking heads, which we knew that the group didn't want. From our sessions, we also knew that the group took the things that we said very literally. We knew that they'd look at the film um, and take it as the final product, rather than an indication of a fleshed out film. And there were things that our participants had said throughout sessions, um, that there were things that they mentioned quite a lot that were just missing. And this just came down to us having more, spent more time in the group um, and getting to know them a little better. And for me, some of my challenges was I was balancing this project and its travel up and down to Leeds with keeping the momentum for the rest of the gallery going. We were also editing and writing for other publications as well. And while in the sessions, you had to be completely present, actively listening to the group. I rarely took notes um, as the group were very wary of this, particularly having so many medical professionals um, and kind of social workers assess their kind of recovery. But the benefits far outweighed any of these challenges. For the group, they practiced socializing with each other, they listened to each other, they encouraged each other. And on one filming occasion, staff were amazed at the relationships we'd formed with our participants. Um, some of their words are on the screen now um, from the final evaluation. And it was encouraging to know they felt that way after a two year project. For visitors, it means they can hear directly from people who have experience of a brain injury. That story will be in that space for 25 years. It's not a story I could have told myself. I couldn't have read about it. And even watching Louis Theroux's documentary wouldn't have given me the insight that the group did. Nor would I have got to know a brilliant set of people. And for me, it was an incredibly emotional experience. But it also now means I'm incredibly open to co-creating content, to embark on a project with complete unknowns, to invite collaboration, critique and co-creation. Because handing over the control meant that the gallery would be so much poorer without that experience. I'm going to hand over to Imi now, who's going to talk you through the second project. Thank you, Selena. So the participation project I'll be talking about is one of two that sit within the Medicine and Communities Gallery. Entitled Our NHS, this project explores the NHS, its workforce and service users, all based on responses to the key question, 70 years on from its launch, what does the NHS mean to you? Next slide, please. Working towards democratising museum practice, the project was driven by a participant-led steering group who guided content and recruited a wider participant circle. Participants came from a variety of roles within the NHS, from porters and communications teams, to receptionists and paramedics, 
and there were also individuals purely representing patient perspectives. This setup um, with a steering group approach came with its own benefits and challenges, and it's something I'd happily expand on in the Q&A. Crucially, the project was facilitated by external contributors Rinku Mitra and Nina Sohal, who came with lots of existing community collaboration experience, and without whom this really wouldn't have been possible. Next slide, please. To give you a little context about the gallery in which this project sits, Medicine and Communities examines the health of challenges faced by groups, communities and whole populations, ranging from epidemics to the provision of health services. And one section of this gallery looks at the history of places of care from medieval sites through to the modern hospital system and the National Health Service. And it was here exploring the NHS that it was felt a participation project was particularly well suited. Next slide, please. So why participation? Interactions with and attitudes towards the NHS are diverse, changing and complicated. And we've seen this more so recently than ever. It was acknowledged early in the project that we would struggle to sum up today's NHS through conventional interpretation. We wanted to introduce original and diverse perspectives to the gallery through varied lived experience and human-centered narratives. And by working with participants in this way, we hope to give a sense of the complex role that NHS has in our lives. This also builds on the aims of the gallery to recognize that people are the experts in their own experience. And it was also felt that providing uh, the project provided an opportunity for individuals to gain new knowledge, understanding and skills. Finally, it was hoped that by collaborating with participants, we could enhance the Science Museum's collections by providing opportunities to identify objects for display and acquisition, and in turn increase the relevance of our collections and displays to our visitors. Next slide, please. So I'll quickly um, run through the project outcomes. These were an object display providing a snapshot or time capsule of the NHS today, which I'll be focusing on. A series of talking heads films reflecting the scale and diversity of roles and individuals within the NHS workforce and its service users. And an ambient film that was creatively directed by participants to give a sense of the varied ways the NHS functions. The galleries are uniquely medical and as such, they come with their own set of challenges with so many people coming to the project with varying experiences, emotions and perspectives. There were a few challenges involved in this participation project, but to keep to time, I've chosen to focus on one key challenge, and this was selecting objects for display. Next slide, please. First, I'll quickly introduce the historic display to which the NHS participation project um, reflects and mirrors. Um, to the right of the screen, you can see the displays, including a collection of historic objects adjacent to a montage of archive film footage. The objects include spectacles, dentures, the Madrisco hearing aid, and the leaflet that came through the, every household letterbox in the UK. These items are de uh, deliberately symbolic to represent what were many people's first encounters with the service. The Science Museum's collections feature objects strongly linked to the launch of the NHS, as those mentioned. And the service is, of course, implicit throughout the galleries, with so many people uh, and objects almost imbued with a subconscious connection, given that the NHS forms a backdrop to our lives. But how, through just a handful of objects, might we try and explicitly reflect on the NHS today? Rather than try and select ourselves, we collaborated with the group to put forward their own suggestions. In a series of workshop sessions, participants were introduced to the Science Museum's existing collections and were asked to brainstorm and discuss what an object display reflecting the NHS today might look like. For inspiration, the group considered items found in their own homes and workplaces, as well as items featured in a series of short films produced for the project. But generating ideas for this contemporary object display was a real challenge. We had envisaged that this wouldn't be straightforward, and there were a few restrictions early on in the project, including a small display case, which was later cut in size again. But on reflection, there were quite a few other reasons that this might have been the case. Next slide, please. Generally, it was challenging to reflect something so vast and nuanced through objects. It was really clear from group sessions that there was a sentimentality around our NHS, 
and there was a sentimentality around particular objects or personal stories. But these two things didn't always connect up. There was also the barrier of how museums are perceived. For example, some participants found it difficult to get beyond thinking of historical objects, which is likely due to preconceived ideas of a museum as a whole as a home for old things. There was also the challenge of participants not believing or having the confidence that their everyday objects were special or important enough to go on display in a museum. And I think it's interesting to reflect on both of these points and how they highlight how much more we need to do as organisations to ensure museum collections reflect the communities we serve and are seen as places where their stories can be told. And this really shows the importance of participation projects like these in democratising and collecting uh, democratizing the collecting and display process. In some cases, participants felt their object suggestions were too mundane or everyday, but through discussion, discussion, participants began to feel that these sorts of objects could reflect the NHS as a backdrop to our lives. And it was exactly these kinds of objects that the group eventually selected. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, mock-ups from workshops on the left and the final display on the right. Items selected range from a birth tag and name badge to hand sanitizer and a stack of prescriptions, many conveying the sense of familiarity of our interactions with the NHS. Next slide, please. So what were the lessons learned and legacy? The process of selecting objects in a participatory way has given me lots to reflect on. The project highlighted for me that we need to do more when collaborating with participants, whether working towards object display or acquisition, and unpicking what objects mean in museums. Because even the word object has a very different meaning when you work in a museum. And the act of collecting or seeing value in everyday objects isn't something that can immediately be learnt. As a result, more time and thought is need to, needed to empower participants to feel confident in selecting objects. More recently, we've been reflecting on the challenges of collecting COVID-19 and how we as museum professionals can share our interest in the everyday material of the pandemic and how these mundane things can often have just as much cultural meaning and memory, in fact, more so than the latest piece of science tech. The links formed with participants of the RNHS projects have become increasingly important in unexpected ways as we have been able to continue relationships for the Collecting COVID project. So in general, like with many funded projects, relationships with most participants initially came to an end as the galleries opened. The project will be on display for 25 years and visitors encountering it will be, encountering it will be able to read about the context of its creation and hear the stories of a wide range of participants. But what is the legacy of the objects selected by participants? Once some of these enter our permanent um, collection and our collections online, how then will people digitally engaging with them find out about the participation project and its wider outputs? This is something we have yet to put in place, but will hopefully add to the legacy of the project. Next slide, please. Up on screen are just a few quotes from participants when giving feedback after the last in-person session. Summative evaluation is due to take place soon, with a specific evaluation in time uh, in place for participation projects. It will be interesting to find out if visitors who encounter these collaboratively creative displays will find greater relevance to their lives or engage more readily with the content. Next slide, please. And just to quickly finish, I wanted to share this slide which shows just a few of the many participants involved in the project. A really huge thank you to all participants and the facilitators for each project. And me and Selena would be very happy to chat with anyone who wants to find out more and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Selena and Imogen for your presentation and insights into your projects. I think medical collections can present uh, certain interpretation challenges um, and historically have sometimes been one sided. Uh, so it was really good to hear how you managed to weave those more personal and social dimensions uh, into the overall medical story. Now I can see there are lots of questions coming through on the chat. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly read a couple out to you now, uh, just so that you can be thinking about your answers uh, while we hear the next presentation. Um, so we had a question about um, 
the possibility of members of the group dropping out, which did happen? Um, and did you have any backup, backup plans if none of the group wanted to participate in the end? And we had another question around uh, participatory engagement training. Uh, and so when we come back to the Q&A, if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. How did you ensure staff felt confident working with the groups? And we had a third question on um, the galleries being fabulous examples for hearing first-hand stories from people rather than about them. Um, so could you talk about uh, if and how you first made contact, how you maintain the contact if you do, um, do you think that's important and what the challenges are around that? So I guess kind of about the sustainability of this kind of project work. So while you're thinking about those uh, good questions, um, we're going to hand over to our next speaker, uh, Liz Mitchell from Manchester Museums, who is going okay. to be talking about their project to redevelop Blackpool uh, in collaboration with their local communities. So over to you, Liz, if you're ready. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, right, let me just start this off. There we go. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Mitchell. Um, I actually work for Manchester Art Gallery, not Manchester Museums. Um, and my presentation is called Building a Sustainable Future for Platt Hall, or What is a User-Generated Museum Anyway? Um, it may be a little untidy in some ways, um, which probably reflects in part the untidiness of this project at this stage, because it's very much an exploratory project. Um, but I would like to start with um, just a little um, anecdote, a story about something that happened earlier this year. Um, this is a photograph taken in Platfields in South Manchester um, on the 10th of, Ju of June 2020. Um, a couple of days before this, a group of residents in Rushholme, Mossside and Fallowfield, the three wards that surround Platt Hall, organised the first of several weekly gatherings in support of the Black Lives Matter global protest against the murder of George Floyd. Um, Every Wednesday at 6 p.m. through June, July, people gathered to take the knee in Platfields and um, protest and demonstrate in support of this movement. A couple of days before the first event, uh, I and my colleagues at Manchester Art Gallery received an email from the organisers inviting us to participate, um, which was a friendly invitation but prompted quite a lot of anxiety, a flurry of anxiety across the various offices of the City Council. The event was going to be held on the doorstep of Platt Hall, the 18th century textile merchant's house and former gallery of costume where I work. This was a couple of days after the pulling down of Edward Colston's statue in Bristol. So responses varied from uh, a, a level of anxiety about what the most appropriate response was likely was, should be to this event, how we should support it in a meaningful way. Was there any risk to Platt Hall? Uh, what was the tone of the event going to be? Um, a lot of to and fro discussing, you know, what should we do? How should we respond? Um, and ideas kind of thrown around and dismissed. Anxiety levels were high. Um, and it was interesting. The reason I kind of pull it up really is because I think for the first time, this beautiful Georgian house in a park in South Manchester suddenly looked rather different, had rather different connotations. Uh, why is it here? What is its history? What histories are woven through its fabric? What values might it speak of? Whose house is it? Situated on the junction of three of Manchester's most diverse wards, wards that also rate quite highly on deprivation indices. So to move forward to last week, those of us who work at Platt Hall hosted a panel discussion to consider approaches to anti-racism in the wards of Rushholme, Mossside and Fallowfield. Again, anxiety levels were high. How could we or should we speak on this subject? From what position? With what history? Who are we in this conversation? A team of all white, mostly female curators and learning managers. As one of our panel speakers said, when she was first invited to take part, she sighed wearily and thought to herself, yet another request to tick the politically expedient um, diversity box for the middle-class white museum. 
this is the kind of environment that um, we're working in and it can't be ignored. And it got me thinking, I was one of the panel speakers as well, and I was terribly anxious about it. And I've been wondering since what to do with this discomfort, this anxiety, the intrinsically problematic nature of my position. Would we have been engaging in a discussion of this kind if this summer's events had not taken place, really? If museums weren't being dragged kicking and screaming into addressing the undeniable fact of their history as instruments of colonialist ideologies? Because that is the reality. My discomfort is so negligible compared to the lived experience of people of colour in this country that I'm almost ashamed to own it. But it's difficult and it runs the risk of closing me down, which isn't helpful. So I've been wondering how to make it useful. To return to earlier in the summer and the, black, the Take the Knee um, events in Platt Fields, the answer was actually oddly obvious once we kind of thought of it. Rather than co-opting the event with some grand but superficial gesture, a physical equivalent of the Instagram blackout, if you like, um, a more appropriate response was to simply ask the organisers what they would like us to do. Um, they wanted to highlight the reason for their choice of site for the gathering, which was not to topple the master's house, but to reactivate the now empty plinth, which you can see here, a piece of stone in the park. Um, in front of the hall that was once occupied by the figure of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln statue was removed from this plinth in 1986 and now sits in the city centre. And there is a very vocal group of people locally who feel keenly the loss of this statue in Platt Fields um, and interpret it in some ways perhaps as the sort of city centre co-opting things from the outlying neighbourhoods that are less visible. So, with about 24 hours notice and very limited resources in the midst of lockdown, we did, oh, that's, sorry, that's um, where a plat hall sits. In the midst of lockdown, we did something very simple, very low-fi, very low-key, COVID friendly. We printed out some pictures of the statue of Abraham Lincoln when it did stand in Platfields and wrote on the windows. It was a very small moment, but it was quite a big lesson actually. It was a lesson about listening. It was about lesson, a lesson about being flexible, being responsive, and not being all about us, but about being quiet and um, finding out what was most appropriate to the situation. About being a good neighbour, if you like. Manchester Art Gallery is a large city centre venue, and we work with every ward in the city, but we don't live in the wards in the city. Um, Platt Hall sits within the wards, so it's kind of about being a good neighbour within those wards. So, just to come back to Platt Hall, what is Platt Hall? Platt Hall is a branch of Manchester Art Gallery. It was built in the 1760s for John Lees, a textile merchant, and his wife Deborah Worsley, um, an heiress to the Platt Estates. So it's the house of a merchant turned landowner. It's a miniature stately home. It's a place to play aristocracy, or that's why it was built. Over time, since then, um, it spent much of its time as a domestic home, at first for the Worsley family, and then later as the city spread out and kind of swallowed it up to a series of tenants as the family no longer lived there. From 1910, when the estate became a municipal park, it's gone through a range of different identities. It was a tea room for the park when it first opened, then during First World War, it was housing for Belgian refugees, and then latterly a conscientious objector's uh, work camp. During the Second World War, it was temporarily a police headquarters and then a junior art school. In between the wars, it, was, it became part of Manchester Art Gallery and was a branch gallery and hosted exhibitions circulating from the city centre. And then from 1947 until 2017, so for seven, 70 years, it was the Gallery of Costume, uh, the first dedicated museum of costume in the world um, and home to Manchester Art Gallery's um, outstanding collection of fashion and dress. This is how it is held in local memory. Now, the Gallery of Costume, oh, this is some of its interior, um, is a beautiful uh, piece of Georgian architecture in the city, uh, one of the very few surviving um, examples of Georgian architecture in the city. And this is it as the Gallery of Costume over the years. 
Gallery of Costume closed in 2017 due to a combination of issues that made it no longer viable, a leaky roof, a moth infestation, and ongoing budget cuts that made staffing it almost impossible. More than that though, the collection had outgrown the space available and was at risk of becoming significantly damaged through poor storage. Since 2017, it's become a working conservation space and collection store. This is what much of it looks like currently. Every room is taken up with the collection in a state of undress, if you'll excuse the pun, as it is assessed, rehoused, and prepared for eventual relocation to another site, which is not yet ready to receive it. So this whole process will take a good four to five years. In the meantime, I was appointed in the summer of 2019 uh, under an Esme Fairbend Collections Fund grant to begin the process of, using the language of the funding bid, transform Platt Hall into a user-generated museum. This is an exploratory project uh, with further funding from the Paul Hamlin Foundation. We've had, or we will have had two years to test and try out a variety of approaches, ideas, activities designed to understand better how Platt Hall might sit within its local neighborhood and be a vital part of that neighborhood. When I started, the hall had been closed for two years with little information available um, as to what was happening inside, and it looked pretty much like this. Um, shrouded in scaffolding as essential roof repairs were done. So what is a user-generated museum? That's the question that was on everybody's lips once I started in post. And a whole lot of questions came out of that. Who are the users? Who decides? Where does decision-making and power sharing sit within such a model? And where does that leave the institution, Manchester Art Gallery, tasked with responsibility for the building and its contents? How do we balance legal and ethical responsibilities towards the preservation of heritage with the pressing needs of a culturally and economically diverse neighborhood? How do we ensure parity of representation across constituencies that may have conflicting priorities? And how do we position ourselves as residents and users, as well as professionals within that mix? And then there's collections. How might collections with all the complex power dynamics embedded in them be activated as part of this process? So working with my colleagues at Manchester Art Gallery, we sort of came up with a, a model for Platt Hall that was that sort of the identity of Platt Hall being summed up really in the intersection of people, place and collections as a way of trying to articulate what it was, what it was that's unique about Platt Hall. Because Using the phrase user-generated museum in a public forum is not helpful. Uh, I very quickly found that out. Um, we got accused of either nebulous PC nonsense or expectations that anything goes. We can have anything because we're the users. So no, we're not selling off the collections and turning it into a generic community center. No, you can't have it as a studio and we can't put in a swimming pool, hold seances or hire it out for parties. No, you can't store your local archives here or hold exhibitions of work by local artists because it's currently full of stuff. It was very difficult to know really how to proceed. What we did do was um, work to opening the doors just a little after two years of um, totally public closure and invite people in to come and experience the kind of unique combination of place and collections that um, Pat Hall presents. So we held a number of exploratory tours of the house and the collections that are stored within. Um, and in the context of that, hosted a series of discussions looking at what the perceived local need was in the neighborhoods of Rush Home, Fallowfield and Moss Side. 90 people came to these sessions and from the conversations that ensued, we distilled a series of principles and priorities for the future. I'm not going to read all these out um, if this is, this is being recorded, so you can always pause the video at a later point. But essentially, the kinds of conversations that we had kind of yielded six principles of belonging, sociability, creativity, action, curiosity, and pride. So we mo made, we've made those the kind of cornerstones of everything that we've done since. And through this engagement, there were, there were, through this process, there were two kind of other key things that came out of it that we didn't previously understand fully. 
One of these was the nature of local investment, pre-existing investment in Platt Hall, that there was a very forceful local small body of people um, who were very invested in Platt Hall as the gallery of costume, as um, a really internationally significant place on their doorstep. Um, they were upset that this had been taken away from them. They were distrustful of the city council that they were going to sell off the collections and sell the building for a pound. Um, they were, they felt, um, they felt ignored. So part of our aim was to re-establish a relationship of trust with this group of people, but at the same time to recognize that they're only a drop in the ocean of the wider population in this area, many of whom may have no relationship at all with Platt Hall or not even feel that it's anything that could possibly interest them or have something to offer them. So we were kind, we, uh, so in January of this year, we were looking at developing a kind of two way program about bringing people into the hall and taking the hall out into the neighborhood. And we were very excited by this um, project, a Museum on My Street or Pop Up Platt Hall. Um, of taking um, a bike, the sort of stand that you could take out into the neighborhood, park up in different streets and facilitate a series of conversations with residents based on street demographics around what they do in their neighborhood, how they live, work and play in their immediate neighborhood through, through facilitated conversations with objects. At the same time, we also thought rather hard about, about the change of identity for Platt and its history, its changing identity over time. The gallery of costume clearly held a very special place in people's memories. And there was a fear that we were riding roughshod over those memories. So that resulted in a shift of concept really, rather than embarking on the new phase of Platt Hall's identity, we realized that actually where we are is in transition. So we reframed the project as Platt Hall in between, um, based on uh, William Bridges best-selling book, uh, Transitions, which looks at the psychology of endings and beginnings and the transitional space that is necessary to pass from ending to beginning, to process what is gone, um, work, work through what must be let go and what must be retained so that you can move forward into the future productively and with an open heart. So that's where we are. We're in between at the moment. Platt Hall is no longer the gallery of costume, which has been well known for for many years, but it is not yet this user generated museum that it may become in the future. And we're going to sit in the in between for a little while to work out what that actually looks like and what the things are that we need to carry forward. So that's where we got to in January. Then, uh, happened, um, and everything closed down. 2020, um, yeah, COVID, the murder of George Floyd, climate emergency, the legacies of decades of social inequality laid bare through all of these things, local authorities suddenly teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, the devastating impact on cultural organizations at the same time as a powerful critique of, of those very organizations for not addressing their role in the upholding of systemic and structural racism in this country. Plus, we were chucked out of the hall just as we'd got a foothold back inside. In some ways, this put everyone in the same boat. No one could access Platt Hall. Thrown back on the resources we could use, we established a digital space with a dedicated project website and focused on what we could do to support people locally through the immediate emergency. And that's where this um, slide comes in. So rather than projecting too far into the future, we focused much more on how to um, cheer people up, basically, um, in the context of very difficult times. We commissioned a local collective that are uh, based over the road from Platt Hall to come up with a series of installations in the park and in the streets around the hall and in the windows of the hall. That's what the Platt Hall Climate Emergency Hub um, sign is. We developed um, trails through the park, encouraging people who were um, flocking to the park in their droves to keep moving through the park because the parks department were really struggling to manage people dwelling in the parks and wanted to keep people moving. So we, we set up a trail through the park and encouraged people through the use of the Love Exploring app to find their way through the park. 
This autumn, we've used the windows of the hall um, to do message to the neighborhood, inviting local people to contribute hints and tips for feeling better in times of difficulty, which started slowly, but is now really growing in momentum. And given that there are 38 windows in Platt Hall, we've got lots of window space to fill. And we had our very small scale response to the take knee um, gatherings in June. So in some ways, lockdown has been a blessing for Platt Hall because we've stopped battling the phys difficulties of physical access to a space that has been caught up in um, the rules and restrictions of a collection storage site. And this is one of the other learning things that actually is pretty critical to our future development um, around the difficulties of a conservation and storage space co coexisting with a public engagement space. Um, in most museums, this is um, at different ends of the spectrum. Collections management and conservation take place behind very closed doors. At Platt Hall, they coexist with the public engagement. Um, so in lockdown, we've been able to do much more online. Um, we are sharing collections digitally and exploring, um, exploring them through our collections chat program. And this, I'm going to zoom very quickly through this because I'm conscious that I'm going to run out of time. Um, this is a couple of examples of um, work done through a social prescribing program, Combating Social Isolation, uh, where every week we host um, a conversation where people are referred from either their GP or uh, local charities supporting vulnerable people to join us for an online conversation pick two objects from a series of objects, 100 objects from Platt Hall on our website, and we have a chat, and it's that simple. And through that, we have learnt different things about our collections. So this example, um, a group from Women's Voices, a charity that supports refugees and asylum seekers, chose these little moulds in the bottom right of the screen, and we had a conversation about sweets, about the universal love of sweets about henna patterns on hands, about cooking jalebi, about the love of custard. Uh, one of the women who participated was actually cooking her evening meal for her family whilst we did it. So it brought people, place and collections together in a rather different way than we expected because everyone was in their own home. Since then, our conservation team have got involved um, and we're looking at these objects in an entirely different way. Um, as as things that might actually be facilitators of sociability, as things that could be made into gifts, as things that are about the pleasures of sweets. And really what I wanted to say, the, the kind of key point about all of this, emergency has now become a way of life, um, a changed world order, and it's time to reflect and rethink our priorities. So I had some questions based on partly on our anti-racism event last week, but also thinking about what the challenges are with Platt Hall, what, what the challenges are for museums that Platt Hall in particular throws up. And this comes down in part to the relationship between um, collections and people and the notion of care. In his new book, The Brutish Museums, Dan Hicks calls on the largely white field of museum curators to disavow their authority while offering their expertise in the service of anti-racism. And I would like to think about this in relation to material things. Museums may be defined in many ways, but what differentiates them is their mandate to look after stuff on behalf of society. Mandate from whom, you might say. So another question might be, what does disavowing authority means in terms of responsibility for the stuff in our care? Which brings me to a word that seems to be enjoying something of a moment in the spotlight currently, and is something I would really like to interrogate. And it's my question actually for this, this session, which is around care. It's the latest in a long line of adjectives that have been placed in front of the word museum in recent years. We've gone from the responsive museum to the participatory museum, to the happy museum, to, in a seminar I was in this morning, the Caring Museum. The Caring Museum is what we're now talking about alongside the brutish one. Um, there is much talk of care currently in terms of the need for care, but the low value placed on care, burdens of care, self-care. The origin of the word curator is the Latin curare, meaning to take care of. But over time, this word came to mean instead guardian or overseer. 
one in charge of a museum. A curator is someone who... Sorry, Liz, we might have to uh, stop in a second, if that's OK, just to have some time okay. for Q&A. OK, I will move on then. I would like us to um, explore how we align care of collections and care of communities. The housing preservation, understanding and safekeeping of material things alongside the um, care and attention to environment, contextual knowledge, understanding of vulnerabilities in relation to the lives of the people we work with. Because these things are often at odds, but actually they have an awful lot in common. And I would like to focus on unpicking some of those things. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liz. I wish I wish we had the time Sorry. to do everything. Um, but you'll be pleased to hear the reason why we can't is because we have so many amazing questions um, coming through on the chat. So um, we'll get straight into it. And I think this question uh, could be to both, uh, both talks tonight. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you first made contact um, with the people that you worked with um, and how you maintain that contact afterwards or if you're planning to maintain that maybe just a little something about the sustainability of these kind of community projects um should we start with selena and imogen uh yeah i'll take that one first um so for the obviously there are different for the different projects but for the rnhs project um it really part of it really came from the facilitators rinku mitra and nina sohal so some of some of it came from their existing connections in the field, um, but also there was a lot of kind of call out um, kind of tentative connections made by email and sending letters. Um, but interestingly, initially it was hoped that the project would span lots of locations across the UK, but um, for kind of practical reasons, it, it ended up being a London focused uh, participation group. And in terms of kind of the sustainability of contact, I suppose one of the interesting things about the participation project I worked on was we had a steering group who then facilitated and recruited a wider participant circle. And that really meant that, um, that they were even further removed from communication, direct communication with us, which was great for the steering group to have such, a, such autonomy over what was going on and to have really informative discussions it did mean that communication with the wider group, um, we didn't really have a way of getting a sense of if they really got anything from the project. So um, that was a bit of a challenge. And Liz, have you got anything to, to add to that? Yeah, um, that, that for me actually initially was, was a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the keys there was uh, working with our learning team who have a really good set of networks um, locally already and recognizing, recognizing that network management, that relationship management with the sort of key brokers, if you like, service providers and brokers in the neighborhood of Platt Hall as being a real expertise and skill in its own right. So initially the learning team at Manchester Art Gallery were not part of this project, but um, I th it, it was immediately apparent that they really, really needed to be. Um, and then it was, I yes, it is identifying key service pro providers locally, um, the Buzz NHS network, which um, has fantastic networks locally, the local library, um, the local church, um, the local civic society, um, and putting things out, also the age-friendly newsletter that goes out in supermarkets um, and magazines, all sorts of things, just putting out feelers and then um, and, and um, putting things through letterboxes as well. So, and then capitalizing on that to kind of um, further those, those relationships. I think maintaining them is a real challenge actually. And where we are at at the moment, we've had lots of conversations with people, which then generate a lot of excitement and interest and desire to be involved. And then it's how you kind of maintain that and take that to the next stage with a, a, a restricted amount of capacity um, is quite a challenge. And that's, that's something we're kind of working on at the moment. Thank you. Um, and we've got another question about collections, uh, which is good. So collections are a focus of a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, and I wondered how you went about actively collecting material um, to represent in the display. So both contemporary and historical material. And should we go to Selena maybe first for that one? Um, yeah, so our participants actually found picking objects relatively easy. They were really in tune 
with visitors, which um, was brilliant. Um, we had a slightly different problem in that we couldn't ask them to give us the actual thing because a lot of them were either still using it. Um, so one of them was um, a golf badge from the, uh, the British Open that was a real focus of their motivation. So we sourced um, duplicates in many ways. Um, so their objects are represented, but and they wrote their own labels as well. So we've kind of married up the two. I get that that's not, you know, you the real thing in museums is a real kind of challenge as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we went about it for um, our project. Um, I would say that the focus for the Platt Hall project at the moment um, is uh, partly uh, ref reflecting the fact that it has been a museum of costume for such a long time and is associated with, with costume and textiles, is kind of expanding that. So um, the 100 objects on the Platt Hall website was a, um, intended to open up the scope of what the collections at Platt might be. And similarly, uh, one of the key things that I'm really interested in is actually looking kind of critically and creatively at what, how we, how we categorize those objects. You know, what, what are the stories that in, what are the stories that we prioritize, the dominant stories that result in this object being placed in this category rather than this category? So it's documentation really. Um, and some of the things that we're doing at the moment is focusing on opening up kind of pathways through the collections that might actually challenge some of the structures and categories in which we document them so that we are not kind of we're moving away from dominant narratives of what those objects might mean. But at the same time, recognizing that Platt Hall with its collections sits within a neighborhood of homes that are full of things. Um, that constitute a kind of broader collection. So our project um, Museum on My Street was intended to set the material that's held in Platt Hall in dialogue with a sort of broader expanded local collection, if you like, held in people's homes, um, with a view then to thinking about the future of collecting at Platt Hall and how we do that. We had to put a stop on that because the increased restrictions as the second wave approached meant that it was it was encouraging gathering and we couldn't really do that. So that is on hold at the moment. But through the online chats, we are, um, you know, we're in people's homes, people bring their objects to um, the conversation as well. So they're in dialogue with the Platt objects. And then we do need to look next at, well, what does that mean in terms of future collecting and the communities? Thank you. So I think we've got time just for one last question, but it will have to be quite a quick answer. Um, Selina, you mentioned that staff had participatory engagement training. Uh, could you just talk a little bit more about that and how you ensure how you ensured that staff felt confident working uh, with new groups? Um, so, yeah, this was um, a two hour session we had before we even started thinking about participation in the medicine galleries. Um, it was led by Katie and she's an expert. So she kind of gave us um, some of her own experiences about some of the things we should be mindful of that we'll have to be flexible in our sessions to adapt to our participants needs and wants um, and really to say that it was something we could always talk about so particularly for my project the train home became like a debrief where we could kind of talk to each other learn from each other or kind of decompress and that was brilliant in making a team for us a little team of three but I think then some people felt excluded um, back at the museum because they weren't in in this bubble with us so I think it's about knowing what you need and knowing what you don't know and I think it's participation you can read a lot and you can talk a lot about it but actually you learn an awful lot by doing and I think it's having a supportive environment in which to do that. Thank you so much. Um, what a great answer and a, and a nice way to end. Um, we're unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining us tonight and for your comments and questions. We will try to get to some of the answers on Twitter. Um, so do keep in touch uh, using the hashtag culture D&D. &D. Um, and our speakers have said that you are very welcome to contact them um, individually um, if you had any question that you asked. Uh, that we haven't managed to get to tonight. Uh, so do take them up on that offer. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you all for coming. Um, and a huge thanks to our speakers, Liz Mitchell, Selena Hurley and Imogen Clark, uh, who have kindly shared their experiences tonight. 
Um, and thank you to the team at Colchester and Ipswich Museums for putting the work in to have this uh, much needed and important conference. And you'll be able to catch up uh, with this event as we'll be making it available on YouTube very shortly. Um, and you can find the previous two in our series there as well. <laughs> our next session is next Wednesday, the 25th of November, here on YouTube at 1.30 p.m. So mark your diaries. Uh, we'll be going beyond the museum walls and talking loans and international partnerships uh, with the Courtauld Institute, Brighton and Hove Museums and Colchester Museums. Uh, so do join us then. Uh, do keep in touch on Twitter using our hashtag. Um, and thank you again for watching. Um, have a really good rest of the evening and take care.